From the banks of Dewey Lake, it's the Dewey Pod Monster. Alright, welcome back. My name is John and this is the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. This is your weekly and the original podcast about consumption. And this week it is also about Christmas. With me this week, as always, is the host of the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. His name is Sean. Sean, how are you doing today? I, I'm amazing. Don't I sound like it? You sound sexy, sultry, all the things that you want to be. Of course, this week we have a very special guest. He's one of our favorite people to have on and has one of my all-time favorite podcasts. We have BP with us from the Let's Talk Horror channel. BP, how are you doing this afternoon, morning, whatever it is? I don't know what that time is. I could look, but I can't be bothered. Uh, yeah, I'm living the dream. You all right? couple handsome devils. I couldn't be <laughs> more happy to speak to you about this movie. Handsome? I don't know about that. Yeah, we're bloody handsome. Bearded, bearded men. Yeah, well, beards are essential here. We, we have to hide the uh, extra chins and all that shit. With three of us on here this week, in this movie, I got a feeling we'll have a little bit more to talk about. We're going to skip the usual like bullshit at the beginning of the episode, and we're going to roll right into it. This week, we are doing our most Christmassy Christmas special that we've done to this point. We've only had two, so take that for what it's worth. But we are talking about the 1984 film Silent Night, Deadly Night. And we always start with a third-party review for our movies. This week's no different, but we are going to quote the illustrious Siskel and Ebert with our infamous review of this film. So why don't you go ahead and listen to that, and we'll come back and tell you what this movie's about. Coming up next at the movies, a film that dreams about... A Red Christmas, the controversial Santa Claus killer movie, Silent Night, Deadly Night. Actually, there have been two controversies about Silent Night, Deadly Night. Even before the film was released a couple of weeks ago, its TV ad campaign caused a furor with its brief depiction of an axe-carrying Santa Claus. The distributor of this film, TriStar Pictures, which is co-owned by Columbia Pictures, CBS, and Home Box Office, pulled the commercial out of release after a week of protest by parents led by a Milwaukee group. Of course, commercials like that usually die out after a week anyway, so thanks a lot, fellas. But there's no question in my mind that the showing of Santa with an axe on free TV and commercials is sick and sleazy and mean-spirited. So let's repeat the names of the people who did it. <laughs> TriStar Pictures, co-owned by Columbia Pictures, CBS, and Home Box Office. Shame on you. Now, as for the film, I've got news for you. It's worse than the TV ad. Telling a typical mad flasher story about a boy who witnesses his father being shot and his mother being stabbed to death by a maniac in a Santa Claus suit. So now the traumatized kid grows up and is asked to work in a, in a toy store as Santa one Christmas, and it freaks him out. He impales one naked girl on a set of antlers, spears another woman with a bow and arrow, and another with a knife, and yet we even see Santa give one little girl a bloody knife as a gift and threaten another little girl with physical punishment as he sits on his lap. You might think that it would be funny, Roger, or Perry. it's played as quite sick in the film. So let me repeat the names of the writer and director and producer of this film. Michael Hickey wrote the film, Charles E. Sellier Jr. directed it, and Ira Richard Barmack produced it. You people have nothing to be proud of, even if you made a few bucks off of all the negative publicity. Your profits truly are blood money. And Silent Night, Deadly Night now has the distinction of joining I Spit on Your Grave as one of the two most contemptible films I have seen. And I don't mean to think it's campy, it really is quite awful. I'm glad you mentioned those people's names because quite frequently they think he will make this exploitation film, we'll be able to buy our uh, Mercedes and live in Bel Air, and nobody will ever know what we did. But I would like to hear them explain to their children and their grandchildren Uh that it's only a movie. I think that would be a real interesting explanation. All right, and then we move on to IMDb where we look at the plot and the outline and whatever they call it here. And first off, on the top of the page, it says, Little Billy witnesses his parents getting killed by Santa after being warned by his senile grandpa that Santa punishes those who are naughty. Now Billy's 18 and out of the orphanage, and he has just become Santa himself. And if we move down to the storyline, it says, After seeing his parents murdered in front of him, a young boy spends most of his life in an orphanage where he is abused by the mother superior. When he becomes a teenager, he gets a job as a toy store Santa. When seeing two people having sex in the store brings on flashbacks of his parents, okay, his turmoil leads him to become a Santa serial killer. I'm going to say these storylines are pretty far off, more so than usual. But BP, you're you're a guest of the week. Why don't we lead in with you? How did you discover this film? And before we get too into breaking it down, what do, what are some of your no spoiler way? Like, let's get started. Kick us off. Where where do we start with this one? Let's give it a go. So yeah, I think I watched this in my teens because 
once I started getting into my teens, I, like I was watching horror well young. And then when I got into my teens, that was when I was watching all the shit, like anything. And I don't think I even watched this at Christmas because that I'm pathetic. But so I didn't even watch it at Christmas. It was just like one of those ones like, there's a DVD, I'll buy that, I'll watch it, there's another one. So it did, I mean, it did, obviously didn't leave that much of an impression on me, but, but, but it's still, you know, it's a movie, isn't it? But it's, uh, yeah, I think. What Perfect always, description. And, yeah, it's, it's a movie. movie. It's a movie. <laughs> and it's one that you can watch at Christmas because, you know, not that there's not enough horror movies that you can watch at Christmas already. I, I think the takeaways from this, like, you know, without going too much into it or not even necessarily takeaways, just things that always stand out to me is the kid's little mullet. That's always pretty cool. I'm pretty sure that he does smack a Santa Claus in the face for real. He does. I also think that he get. I think he gets whipped to shit for real. And the guy that plays the main guy that I've forgotten his name already. Billy. He's actually really good. And it's a shame that his career probably flopped after this. Maybe because of this. Maybe because of it. Yeah, I'm not sure that he did much of anything aside from this. He just went and worked in a hardware store. Random shows and stuff. He hauled boxes around. Yeah. John, what are your, when was the first time you kind of encountered this movie? This movie was another video store relic for me. So much like we had talked about with Sleepaway Camp, I found this trolling the dredges of the horror aisle in my local video store. And I remember seeing the very obvious, you know, it, it was the, the cover with the arm and the axe coming out of the chimney and you, you could tell that Santa Claus. And I was like, definitely going to have to watch that, but I'm going to try to wait till it's not summer. So I remember waiting like six months to rent it, got around to renting it, got it home and realized that my beloved Linnea Quigley was in it and very much so naked as she usual, usually is. So that's never a negative. My initial just extremely high overview on this movie as a teenager, I think I thought the first half of the movie was really slow but it kind of saves itself in the second half of the movie once basically once Billy goes fucking berserk and hits his uh, second gear or third gear, whatever it is. It's pretty entertaining and it's your basic slasher movie. And I, I still agree with that part. But I think upon watching it more, this movie really does a lot of character building and a lot to kind of explain why Billy ends up the way he does a lot more than your average 1980s slasher movie does. I honestly don't think it gets enough credit for that because there's so much character building in this movie for Billy that it's almost to the detriment of this movie. I think the first time I encountered this, like you, is the video store aisle, the horror aisle. And I was probably under 10 when I saw this and still maybe believing in Santa or maybe not. I don't know. But seeing that cover. And not seeing the movie for several years later, that made a big impact where like Santa Claus, the arm and the axe and the chimney really hyped this movie up or not necessarily hyped it up for me as, you know, as a sub 10 year old or whatever, but where you get this idea in your mind of what this movie is going to be. And it's so much more terrifying than the actual movie was. But I agree with you. When I eventually did watch this, it, it wasn't a letdown, but it wasn't you build it up so much in your mind that you think it's going to be something and it's it's not that I think it, I thought of it more of being like a thriller than a slasher at the time. I always think back to the movie called The Evil That Men Do, and I think it's a Charles Bronson movie. But when I heard the ads on the radio or whatever of that movie, it made me think that this movie is about random men choking people out and pushing their eyeballs in and all that stuff. <laughs> and that's the same kind of thing with Silent Night, Deadly Night. I thought like Santa Claus is going to be choking, you know, as a 10 year old, I probably thought that was the worst thing you could do is push somebody's eyeballs in. Still, it's still pretty gnarly. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty rough. But I th I thought this movie is Santa Claus eye gouging a lot of people. And it's not so much that, but it may as well be. It sort of like doesn't know where it where it what it wants to be at some points. It's like, does it want to be a character piece for like a TV movie or does it want to be a full on slasher? Well, I don't think it I think it does know what it wants. I, do, I definitely don't think it wants to be a TV movie. Um, I think <laughs> it blows that out of the water like in the first 10 minutes. But I think this movie does know what it wants to be. Like, I think the fact that they spend so much time doing just I mean, realistically, this movie is kind of like aside from the, the Christmas theme, this is kind of like the apex of what sleazy slashers can be in 1984. It's got borderline like rape scenes if not sexual abuse scenes right out the gate with it it's got all the raunch that you could possibly ask for in this kind of movie gratuitous nudity and like over the top kills it is 
in a lot of ways, the definitive idea of what a slasher movie could be, especially for the early 80s. What separates it really is that character building piece. And I can't imagine that you spend that much time on this movie building that up if that's not intentional. You could have do a super cut of this where you show Billy basically having the worst possible outcome, like the whole choose your own adventure book idea. I don't know if you guys had those over in, in the UK, but we had these books that were choose your own adventure where you could, you know, you read a, a page or two and it says go to, you know, page 15 for this story or go to page 17 for this story. The choose your own adventure in this movie might as well be like go to page two for incredibly massive amounts of trauma that no human being should ever have to fucking endure <laughs> or go to page 17 and have a Merry Christmas. And it's like every time they went to the incredible trauma side as opposed to yeah. going with any like shred of decency for this character. If you want the super cut of all the violent stuff, watch part two. Cause the first half of that movie yeah. is that it's just the cut. We need to... But what, so mm -hmm. that leads me to ask the two, you guys, which version of this did you end up watching? I've watched this three times this week out of enjoyment so i watched the a vhs rip which was provided by someone on this podcast which had all the cut shit i don't know who that could be it's definitely bp pirate extraordinaire extradition laws apply sorry bp right <laughs> every one of them had the all the unedited shit that got added back in though which you can see very clearly from the quality it's like watching friday the 13th too where they all of a sudden it looks like shit and then it's right back to being restored how about you bp which do you know if you watch the cut or the unrated I, it must have been the unrated because it looked like shit. Yeah, I watched it on Plex um, because it was free. And yeah. <laughs> so I watched it on there. And yeah, you can tell it was just like one minute, this shot, absolutely pristine. Next minute, like you can hardly see anything. And then you're like, oh, well, okay, yeah, this is this is the bits that they didn't want to show, but then they've shown now because it makes it better. I think that adds to the sleaze factor of it, though, when you see that unrated version where they cut in all the dailies or whatever it is that they cut. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know enough about film to know why it looks like shit and the rest of it. It's clearly the same the same thing. You know, I don't know how how that works, but it, it adds to that sleazy kind of I shouldn't be watching this feel to this movie mm -hmm. when it has that real grainy, dark, just not graded right look. For those who are listening or for anyone, the easiest way to tell if you're watching which cut you're watching, when you get to the Linnaic Wiggly scene, if you see everything, including her hanging on those antlers for about a solid 30 seconds, you're watching the unrated cut. They're getting the pushed onto the antlers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's all the way. Yeah. If you see that scene and it's maybe like a 10 second scene, you're watching the R rated cut. So that's the biggest difference is that scene alone and it's also quite arguably the most well with one kill aside in the second movie the most memorable kill in the entire franchise yeah that's an iconic that antlers leanna quigley hanging from the antlers is probably i wrote in my note like the most iconic christmas horror thing because part two yeah there's that other one we won't talk about that we're not talking about part two but that right. is so much not a christmasy kind of themed section of that movie whereas this is like yeah, it's Santa Claus. He's hanging somebody on a, a rack of antlers. OK, that's pretty mm -hmm. picturesque. Also, before we go any further, I almost had to stop myself from saying it then. I'm and we say nothing about Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. You say whatever you want, because I was that. Close. This is about Silent Night, Deadly Night 1, but we're big lovers of garbage days. So say what you want to say. And so, we're big lovers of tangents. Yeah, I mean, I I, I mean, because I I mean, I prefer the second one, even though. It's literally the first film <laughs> and then it takes over and becomes something, you know, that, that its own thing. It just becomes an absolute, absolute mental going around murdering people, shall we? Garbage day. <laughs> See, I think the second one is arguably the more fun movie to watch. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that's even arguable. I think that's just what it is. But it's a lot like the Halloween, Halloween 3 comparison for me. It just kind of depends what mood I'm in as to which one I, I prefer. I think if you were to ask me, like, you only have one. Which one do you keep? I think the first one is the stronger film because it does more of the character building. It does. It's it is a straight up horror film. It is. It's got moments that we find funny because we're fucked up individuals, but it's not. It doesn't have the like 80s splash of I don't know if that's even schlock or just like gratuitous like insanity. It's more it's dramatically more grounded than what the second movie is. The second movie is great and definitely, like I said, the movie that I probably find myself watching more because it is more fun. 
But I think the first one does a better job of telling a cohesive story and explaining why this character gets from point A to point B and ultimately points. Well, I feel like the first one's a movie and the second one's like a Tales from the Crypt episode. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so let me just break in for a second here. So the premise of this, and they really set up, while we're talking about two, they really set this up very well. And I don't know if they planned on doing a part two from the beginning, but basically on Christmas Eve, Billy and his family, his mother, his father, his little baby brother are going to this mental facility to see their grandfather. And the grandfather's catatonic. He's sitting in the seat and he's not reacting. And when the parents get pulled away, the grandpa comes to life. The first of many, many questionable decisions for this character that <laughs> happened to Billy throughout this entire fucking movie. <laughs> yes. Well, and that explains a lot. The grandfather basically tells Billy that if only kids that have been good all year get presents from Santa, the rest get punished. And this freaks out Billy because he's been good most of the year. But of course, you know, he's a little kid. He's probably four or something. He's not been great all year. So they leave the, the facility. They're driving home. And meanwhile, this little side story, this this guy dressed in a Santa suit holds up a convenience story, kills the the clerk after robbing him or kills him first and robs him. I don't really know how that works. But on the way home, the family drives and sees this guy in a Santa Claus outfit with his car broken down. He's hailing them to get a ride. The car pulls over. The Santa Claus goes nuts, kills the dad, kills the mom before sexual violence, you know, rips her shirt open. As you do. Yeah, of course. And s slashes her throat in front of Billy and Billy runs off and whatever. So then we pick up the baby brother is left alone. Billy's in an orphanage. He gets whipped by Mother Superior at every opportunity. He gets blamed for everything. The brother's in the orphanage with him. Mother Superior. Billy gets in trouble for everything. Even if he doesn't do anything wrong, he looks at two people in the orphanage having sex in this Catholic orphanage, having sex through a peephole. Mother Superior comes, catches the kids having sex. Billy gets in trouble for it because he left his room and another nun told him, told him he could and gets whipped on Christmas and they force him to sit on Santa's lap, X, Y, Z. Then he grows up eight, 10 years later, he's 18, all this stuff. But the thing is, is that they set it up with the little brother and they have this whole thing. And part two is all about that little brother. So you, have, he's retelling this whole first movie. We're not going to get too much into two, but. Yeah, he's retelling this whole movie with all the uh, and all the shit that goes on with Eric. Who, I think that's the little brother's name. Who is Ricky? Ricky. There we go. The, the actor's name is Eric. Ricky doesn't have all these experiences. He doesn't have the bad memories because he was a baby. So it's kind of it's grasping at straws a little bit. He just keeps on saying he remembers. Yeah. And it's artful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they set this sequel up at the beginning of this first movie. Like, really? You had this in mind? Did you have this in mind? Or is that just a happy accident? Well, even if you think about how they set up the very beginning of this movie, like we, you talk about the Santa that they run into, who is like apparently a sharpshooter, but they even lay groundwork for that. They show Santa robbing a convenience store and he shoots this clerk in the gut and he sees the guy like pulling a gun on him. And he blasts this guy right between the fucking eyes, as dead as fuck, right in the head. And great effect, too. Yeah. And if you think about what happens right after that, that's where you get to where Billy and his family run into Santa, and Billy runs away like a bitch, because probably for the better. I still don't understand how Santa doesn't see him, because he runs across the road where Santa's, like, drunkenly waving his dick around or whatever. But they start by, while... Billy's still in the car before he runs like a bitch. They hightail it in reverse. Again, mistake. Four-year-old bitch. <laughs> well, again, mistake. Why are you going to reverse? Just drive away from Santa. Whatever. And Santa, like, puts one in Dad's head. Again, expert marksman. So they're laying character work, even in this really, in, you know, big picture, small character part of this original Santa that traumatizes the shit out of Billy. He's being a little bit in the bush. I'm not a big fan of uh, victim culture, but this... This movie, watching it as an adult, not watching it as a younger person, you feel really bad for this kid. Because like you said earlier, John, oh, every yeah. bad decision that was made for this kid is made in this movie. And you're like, you can clearly recognize that he has PTSD from being traumatized repeatedly by someone in a Santa. His grandfather telling him Santa punishes bad kids. He gets punished, you know, later on, a few hours later by his parents, his family getting killed. Later on, the the nun, the mother superior, punishes him because of Christmas type stuff. He he always acts out around Christmas. Gee, I wonder why. And then when he becomes an adult, he's got a hell of a left hook, though. Yeah, true. And when he becomes an adult, he gets <laughs> to dress him up in his worst fear as Santa Claus, and he goes nuts. 
He just Your wants figure. to do some bloody good. He's just grown up to be, a, you know, a young, strapping, handsome man. And then he, th- then that's it. And then they're just like, oh, we're just going to treat you like shit. And he d- he's just like, I don't want to go around killing people, but tough shit. I'm going to do it anyway. Now I have to. No, I have to. It's kind of interesting. They do a really good job, like, or the actor does a really good job of showing, like, a mental break in this movie. Yeah. Like, it's not, I mean, it kind of turns into, but it's not, like, what you would expect from, like, a Looney Tune Batman-type mental break where he's just ludicrously screaming and, like, freaking out. I mean, he does freak out quite clearly, but you can almost just see in his face, there's a solid, like, you know, 30-second, like, extreme close-up on his face where you could just see, like, that's it. Downhill from here. Like I said at the start, I genuinely think that he's a very good actor. Like I think, like for me, he's the the thing that sells the movie when he, you know, becomes... oh, him and Lin- Linnea Quigley. Well, but... yeah, obviously, you know. Well, okay, that <laughs> sells the movie to all the men, but I mean, <laughs> it sells the movie in regards to performance and character and sort of driving, uh, driving it. He's actually very good, and obviously, he does. You know, he may- he managed to do quite a lot with quite a little, like running around shouting punish and shit like that like there's not much you can do with that and that's just you know that that's just the character and that's just the writing but as a character he actually does a fantastic job i remember even when i watched this as a teenager i was just like as much like whatever i think about this movie and what it could do better and what it did wrong and stuff i will always take from it that he actually did a very very good job at playing the character more so i don't think he gets enough credit for the way that he portrayed it absolutely agree there's that whole scene where he he's working in the toy store they dress him up as santa he's basically threatening the little kids yeah. to get them Which to calm the great. calm the fuck Again, down 80s parenting at its best because he's they're so like good oh with he's the so kids. good with kids so. all the parents must be fucking deaf as well because they're right fucking there and he's just like <laughs> and they're all like he's very he, quiet about it yeah and he's all like shut the fuck up you fucking little shit <laughs> and then, i'm gonna kill you i'm gonna fucking kill you and then they're all like he's so fucking good with kids idiots it's just an average 80s household yeah exactly. <laughs> that's what the dad was saying or the mom <laughs> right. he dresses up as the, as the store santa the toy store santa he gets plied with alcohol after the fact and the, the co-worker he has a crush on the other stock guy who's a total dickhead goes back and starts sexually assaulting her and as they get them all drunk up he goes in the back and sees them and that's when this mental break happens because he has these flashbacks of his mom getting murdered but yeah, and that's when they do this, the close up on his face. They do the flashing lights, the the pulsing, and there's this white flash. And then his his face goes calm, and he's just off to the races after that. He's absolutely fucked. And also, once again, doesn't even get a thank you. I was, I was he just just stopped her from getting raped, and then she's just like, "Oh, you're fucking mental." And he's just like, "Oh well." Well, she I'm does not... choke the he does choke the guy with a Christmas yeah, lights. I know, but gratitude, <laughs> you know, death. I, I you know gratitude. That's what I think. You know, I know yes, there you go. yes, he murdered somebody in an awful way. No good deed unpunished. But did he stop her from getting sexually assaulted? Yes. Where's the gratitude? Thank you. <laughs> well, you, yes, I, I can agree with that. But I also think maybe if you just witnessed this dude murder the fuck out of someone, and maybe he just did it because the guy called him a moon goon like 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> moon, moon, moon goon. Moon I know. goon. Uh, yeah, I wrote that down because I was like, Moon Goon, that's the insult, as he calls him a Moon Goon. What the fuck's a Moon Goon? You know, maybe he... You've been staring off into space like a Moon Goon. Exactly. <laughs> maybe it was that. Maybe it was that, like, wonderful, folky interlude of, like, bizarre working at the toy store music that is just so out of place in this fucking movie. But if you witness someone murder the shit out of the guy that's trying to, like, fondle you don't you want to at least be like i'm gonna try to get myself out of this situation before i call you a fucking maniac (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. just to kind of go back just a second this setting this toy store setting that he's working at is the perfect place for this because they have all those creepy animatronics the creepy dolls all that stuff it just adds to that Mm -hmm. really unsettling feeling that this whole scene has like he goes off the rails and he's in the perfect setting for it with all these like weird 80s santa claus animatronics that make all the worrying noise as the head you know nods or thrusts its pelvis at you like uncontrollably and i it's tell you perfect, what i wish it's i wish i had setting. all those star wars toys in the background they had because they're a fucking fortune now you get a shitload of money i saw a couple muppets things throughout this movie there's a kermit the frog toy in the orphanage when the kids get the gifts when somebody has a miss piggy that they're flopping around like i don't think henson gave permission to use their likeness in this movie but it's like, it's I, just me. It's like, 
I think I'm going to kill some people today. <laughs> Who's that, Rolf? I don't fucking know. This kid's wearing a pair of Adidas shoes, and the, the sole of the shoe is literally like folding off all the way to the front of his heel. It's like just flat, flopped out. I'm like, hobo <laughs> shoes. I mean, that's probably accurate. But yeah, there's a lot of little details in this. And you're right. The, the toy store is kind of the perfect like backdrop to kind of lead up to this. It's also another in a line of very long, shitty decisions of like, yeah, the toy store is probably fine from like January through roughly October. But really, did you think that was a good fucking idea? Because you know, eventually Christmas is coming, and the the nun that not Mother Superior, the other nun, seems to be the only person in this entire film that's like maybe Billy is shouldn't be around Santa as much as possible. It seems to be a little bit just a slight trigger. Right. For this <laughs> no, see, I disagree. I think she's a fucking bitch, right? Because <laughs> so. I reckon all of her plan is to make everybody think that she's nice. But in fact, she's the fucking worst one because obviously we have that scene in it where Billy gets sent to the room and she's like, don't fucking come out of it. Otherwise I'll whip your ass. Right. And he's just, he's just like, all right, I'll stay in it. That then the nice, whatever fucking, I can't remember what she is, but the nice woman, she goes into the room and then she's just like mother inferior. Yeah, that's it. She's just like sister Margaret. Yeah, Sister Margaret, she's just like, no, it's fine. Go out and play with the rest of them. You know, nothing will happen. When when it comes to the crunch and, you know, like she, Mother Superior comes out and she's all like, oh, you little bastard. What have you done? You, I told you to stay in the room. She says nothing. She doesn't stick up for him. She's just like, no, oh, no, I, I didn't say anything. You know what I mean? She didn't say that. But that's probably what happened behind closed doors. She starts to. She says yeah. Mother Superior and she goes, Mother Inferior, shut the fuck up. And she's just like, well, I must, have fallen, off, I must so. have fallen asleep at that bit, but I still stand by my point. But um, <laughs> but at the same time, and then she's the one that takes him to the store and be like, here's a job in a place where you're going to, you know, where fucking Santa's going to be. So as far as I'm concerned, I reckon that it's all, to, all her fault and uh, she's to blame. And I feel sorry for him. The old film. Lots of bad decisions. <laughs> this movie should be called Silent Night, Deadly Night, Bad Decision bad or something decisions. along those lines. Yeah. Right. Bad How to panda. not raise your child in an hour and a half. Worst case scenario. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it's not their child that they're raising, but yeah, just how not to raise a child. Yeah. I just feel sorry for him. I just feel sorry for the bastard. We've touched on this a little bit, but this is a movie that's pretty, like I said, it, it's as far as the big picture of slasher movies, it's one of the more well-known ones. So why don't we talk about some of the kills? Because the kills are kind of what, I mean, aside from the Christmas theme, one of the things that really make this movie, well, memorable. BP, what are some of your favorite kills in this? Or what are some that we need to kind of point out here? The, the main one, like, I mean, it's, we've already sort of said it. The, the main one where if you get to watch the uncut one, it's just how slow it goes when he's putting her on top of those, like the antlers, and it's pushing through. And this is at a time where, like, even like the aesthetic of the movie helped create the realism as well. So, like, it felt really mm. like it looked real. It doesn't look so shit that you're like, oh, that looks awful. You're sitting there going, I mean, this is pretty fucked up. And then you're like, every time it's pushing through the skin. And you're like, you know, part of you, you know, it's like one of those times when you sit there and go, oh, I hope that never happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's always in the back of my mind. Yeah, it's always in the back no, of my mind. Nobody pushes me on some antlers. I guarantee you that deer head would not hold my body weight up. I'd be <laughs> on the ground quicker than I. But but sometimes it's like in the in horrors and stuff. It's like the deaths are at the forefront of everything because we know like it happens all the time. And they're, that's always where their emphasis is. And it's like how to do it. And sometimes they get it completely wrong because they just stab somebody a hundred times. You don't really see it. And then it's done and it's like, and it's forgettable. But then you get scenes like within these movies that they did so well in like the seventies and the eighties where they just knew like to hold off on those little bits and hold on, linger on on those things and how to do things a little bit more because then they're the things that stick in your mind. I mean, like you're saying, this was 84, 84? Yeah. And you're still in your mind yeah. from when you're a kid or teen or whenever you watch this, you're still like those images still play in your head. And there's, oh, you know, I've seen so many horror films that I've forgotten and little things. And that's why films like this as a slasher work amazingly because you get those scenes where you just don't forget. Like, it's the whole little sort of fight scene with the, the uh, boyfriend at the time and stuff as well, where he just goes flying out a window and 
things like that. And he's just, you know, he's dead. There's loads of little things like the deaths work really well in this. The lead up to her death is done really well, too, though, because you mentioned she has a little fight with her boyfriend or whatever he is. And then she goes and gets dressed, quote unquote. And by gets dressed, she puts on like the tiniest pair of jean shorts and nothing else to let the cat in. And this is where you, the first time you see Billy, like, you see how fucking off the wagon he is. You know, the cat comes in, she closes the door, and he just whips through that fucking door with the axe and screams punish in arguably the best delivery of the line in the whole movie. She does a good job of losing her shit, because what the fuck do you think when Santa Claus just, like, firemans his way through your fucking door and is, like, you know, doing that? You've been, you've been put on the naughty list. Right. And then he corners her in the house, and one of my, like, favorite little fun facts of that he whips the like he throws the axe at her and the axe misses her but lands in the the wall that's a real axe that they threw like that wasn't a i'm sure there's other points in the movie where it's a prop axe but that one where he threw it in the wall that's a real axe that's stuck and i'm sure there's a camera trick to see how close she actually is to the axe like, I'm assuming they didn't endanger Linnea Quigley. Well, it was the IE, they probably did. But then again, it's 1984. They probably did endanger the fuck out of her and, you know, went from there. Yeah, four, four kids died making it. Wait, what? I didn't know that. That's not a fact. It's not a fact. I just made that up. Oh. Um, but, <laughs> but, but they could have. That's what I'm saying. Because we'd never know because it was all about it was all about covering shit up in the 80s. Uh, and that's that's what they did. They're there. just burying children on the side of the house. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If you go there now, there's there's plaques everywhere just for in remembrance of these dead children. Commemoration. Commemoration. That's it. I love the scene because it's so random. Yeah. Billy gets out of the out of the toy store and then he's all of a sudden just at some house. He doesn't know these people. Mm-hmm. He, and then he Kratos is the axe into the wall. You know, I'm surprised he didn't pull it back with like some power or something. And he just like decimates. That is one of my favorite kills of this movie. I think that's like the kill. But I think the other one that I really enjoy for sure is the sledding one where the kids are like <laughs> yeah. the, the kids are these two teenagers are about to go sledding. That's the one I wanted to get to next. Is the, that one? These two so, older guys. That was real. <laughs> again real it's the 80s <laughs> these two older guys probably 20s but the one guy looks like he's in his 30s they take they go and threaten to beat these kids up and they're like okay fine we'll leave the sleds and these two older guys go down the sled and the second the first one goes down this is like the most uninteresting sled ride ever it's so slow they don't go any there's no speed on it and the guy gets to the bottom he's like Woo-hoo! he's selling it though he's making it interesting he is. He's he's selling the shit out of it. He's got like the biggest boner for this sled. And yeah. It doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> yeah, this is so cool. And he at the end he stands up. He's like, "Woo, Woo come he's on!" Like, Whoa. And the second guy. That's yeah. The that first guy is like cat calling and all this crazy shit, <laughs> hooting and hollering. The second guy comes down and Billy jumps out in front of him and just does the baseball swing, yeah. knocks his head he off. Screams naughty and like, naughty, yeah. naughty. <laughs> stole the he stole the sled, man. He should get punished. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely one of the more entertaining beheadings that you see in a movie. And it it even lands well after that, no pun intended, because the body keeps sledding all the way down and he's, you know, quiet now, obviously. He gets all the way to the bottom. Yeah, his his buddy sees his head and then the head comes tumbling down maybe like five seconds later. It's that's the other like those two kills are definitely the most memorable of them of this movie. But even the ones that are like more generic slasher kills, like the the strangling or, as you mentioned, BP throwing the boyfriend out the window, the actual act of throwing the guy out the window is nothing spectacular. It's very Jason Voorhees like he just kind of heaves home. For some reason, he takes his shirt off, I'm assuming, so that we can get to what I'm saying next. When they cut to the body and show him laying there, he's not only dead from like the fall from a second story window or whatever. He's got like a giant chart of glass that's basically across his entire abdomen that's just gutted him. And I'm like, I don't think that's how this would work, but it looks pretty entertaining. And I also assume that that's a scene from the unrated because I'm pretty sure when I first, when I was watching it the other night, the first time I ever watched this, I don't remember that extra (laughs) bit. So I I think that 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 might be an unrated clip as well where he's, you actually see him on the floor. The body shot probably is for sure. Yeah, it definitely has a bit of a crummier look to it. Yeah when they show him laying there <laughs> yeah, and you're like, oh that's unrated well that's it's how it should be but also the the sled bit as well sorry to go back to the sled bit but the two people there that like are supposed to be you know the bullies i'm i'm swear one of them is at least 64 years old it's that second um, guy with yeah, the, puts the hat on the guy that yeah, gets beheaded he looks so, so old 
yeah, I know. And I'm like, I could have, I mean, he's obviously like a key grip or something like that, you know, somebody doing the lighting and they're like, oh, this per- this kid hasn't turned up. Can you do it? And he's just like put on a bit of a voice, like, you know, you're shouting cowabunga or something like that. But <laughs> <laughs> he's just sledding down. But, you know, he gives a shit. He, gets, he loses his head so good. So the other ones like in this, like after we get past, because really that, that like series of events, like Billy's short walk to the uh, orphanage, because that's essentially what he's doing. He's going to go back to the orphanage and fuck up mother superior and we're all fine with that everyone except for mother superior and apparently a cop or two are 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 okay with this but that trip is like the most entertaining part of this movie is him stopping at this random house and just annihilating everyone giving a child a used murder weapon as a christmas gift. love that scene (laughs) a box cutter yeah Yeah. that's actually one of my favorite scenes because once again it's like it shows him like as an actor like the way he's doing it like you don't not believe that he is this person. And that's obviously one of the biggest, hardest sells as an actor to do that. Even in a film like this, it's so easy for these people just to be shit. And he's not. And in that scene, it's just like the sort of not understanding, not knowing what he's doing is wrong because that doesn't even cross. Because he's so, he's so, he's gone. You know, he's flipped like you were saying earlier, Sean. As soon as we get that white flash, he's gone. Everything in his head, that is, everything that's wrong seems right to him. And he sells that so well, just handing over this fucking knife to this kid. And in his eyes, it's just like, you know, I'm fucking Santa. Merry Christmas. Where are the cookies? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That would cookies? Be so another shot that's really cool in this when it comes to Santa kills, he's making his way to the orphanage. And apparently this orphanage has like a bomb shelter or something like that. in it. It's like a root cellar or something. Whatever. It, it's 1984. It very well could be a bomb cellar. What's great about the scene in there, so basically at this point, the cops have an APB out for for Santa, which is totally logical. It's Christmas Eve, and they're like, just shoot whoever you see that's Santa, which, you know, almost turns badly once and does turn badly because they get to traumatize a whole second group of children by gunning down Santa in front of them because he had a candy cane or whatever. Let me, can I touch on that real quick? This guy is walking across the open field towards the kids playing outside in a Santa costume. The police think that this is Billy or the cop that's there thinks it's Billy. And the guy, the Santa goes to shake hands with some kid and they gun him down. I'm like, stop, stop, stop. Boom, 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 boom. And just blast them full of holes. Deserve they tell it. you, they tell you the next scene, like the, the cops driving with the, with uh, sister Margaret to the orphanage. And on the radio, they say, hey, we gunned down a Santa at the orphanage. We think we got him. And they try to ID him. And it's a 50-year-old guy. And they're like, we're looking for an 18-year-old. And they tell you, the sister Margaret tells you, the character is like, oh, that's Father Henry. He was there to, he was the Santa this year. Oh, by the way, he's deaf. So he couldn't (laughs) react to them telling him to stop. (laughs) Who the fuck sends a deaf guy to be Santa to go greet all these kids? Oh, hey, I hope everybody, he can't say anything. He can't talk. The Catholic can't... Church, that's who. Well, also, the go. reason they the reason they send him as well is because he's deaf, so it makes them, they can get away with not giving him what they wanted for Christmas because he didn't hear what the fuck they wanted. He's they just like that. That's ear. not what I wanted, and he's just like... He could just throw his hands up. He <laughs> didn't know. It would have been funny if when Santa fell, if he had one of those big, like, horns that they used to stick up to their ear and, like, Looney Tunes, car- like, <laughs> just falls out of his Santa coat. <laughs> Out of his bag. That's what made the belly. Eventually, Billy does get to the orphanage where the bomb shelter is. And the cop who already shot one Santa is kind of trolling around and looking for Billy, presumably. And he comes up out of this root cellar and and Billy punishes again and nails him right in the chest with the uh, axe and drops him to the bottom of the cellar. The kill itself is fine. It's a pretty typical like axe kill in, you know, your standard slasher movie. What's really great about it, and it's kind of shot weird because it kind of looks like a made for TV shot in a lot of ways, like the way the camera moves. But they do a really good panning shot where they show basically from Billy's like shoulder and kind of go up and over him and straight down the stairs of the cellar over the top of the body where, you know, Dudley Do-Right is dead as fuck at the bottom of the cellar. I'm sure it's been done before, and I'm absolutely sure it's been done after, but it's a really good-looking shot and almost feels creatively out of place for how some of this stuff is in this movie. And it's like the only jump scare of the movie. Oh, yeah. So it kind That's of doesn't also true. necessarily yeah. fit in there. <laughs> they were like, fuck it. I really enjoy the, this isn't a kill, but I really enjoy the bloody axe going through the snowman because who hasn't wanted to like beat the shit out of a snowman just out of general principle. And it cleans the axe. Yeah. Signed. But this, I mean, this movie kind of rapidly comes to a close here because basically after that, he goes in, sees his mother superior and 
slows down just long enough for the cops to get there. And before he can bring down the axe, they they gun him down. And now all these kids have a second Santa Claus in one Christmas that they've witnessed get murdered. In the same day. In the same day (laughs) that they witnessed get murdered. Right. How many Santas are there? (laughs) Right. And why are they all dying? Why are they all getting shot by the police? (laughs) So, yeah, it wraps up pretty quick. And then you see Ricky who leads into the second movie looking yeah, the most stereotypical, like, like killed yeah. right in front of him. Yeah. So he's like the most stereotypical, like brother? evil kid and starts screaming naughty. He should have said that. He just says naughty or something, but naughty. Yeah, that's naughty. pretty much how we wrap this movie. So what am I missing? What do we need to talk about still that we haven't? When he, as he dies, he says, you're all safe now. Or something like that. Oh yeah. Santa can't kill you now. Or that's something. it. So, yeah, that's it. It's all over. Yeah. Something Is like it... that. We've got four more movies. But yeah, but the problem right. is, is that Five. once again, oh, no, four. No. I don't know if this just shows that obviously that there's something wrong with me, could be the case, but I just spent the whole film feeling sorry for him. And when he died, I didn't want him to die. I wanted him to kill the rest of them. I think going back and again, looking at it. I mean, Mother through, Superior for sure. Yeah. At least. I was waiting for her to get it, even though I've seen it and I knew that she didn't. I was like, maybe she'll get Please. it this time. It's kind of <laughs> like when you watch a, <laughs> you watch a sport or something, you already know the outcome and. Yeah, you know, you watch you a boxing talking. match or a football game or something, and after it, you know who lost, but you're like, oh, they're cu- they might have a chance. It's like they're not going to yeah. win or whatever. You kind of right. feel like maybe something's going to happen. <laughs> I already know. But he gets man. You when you watch it as an adult, you watch it. The, this most recent watching, like BP, I felt I felt bad for the guy because yeah. every and John mentioned it earlier. Everything that could go bad for this guy goes bad. Like the wrong, de- the wrong decision on every front is made. And the movie is like 45 minutes. This character, it's an hour, an hour and 23 minutes or something. That's the uncut, like unrated version. You get 45 minutes of pure character building of Billy, of all the shit that's happened to him, all the bad stuff, why he's the way he is. And then we get out of about 40 minutes or whatever the balance is, 38 minutes of all the killing and all the bad shit. And it's like, two movies but it, it, they they go together while it's not like the best shot movie or it's not the best premise of a movie well it's a pretty good premise but it's not like the it's not an oscar worthy performance but it's like a great melding of these two these two ideas that kind of come together to make this really great and arguably probably one of the first christmas slashers it's interesting because <laughs> i yeah, i um... <laughs> i didn't mean for there to be silence i didn't have anything else to say that was the end of my statement I find it really interesting because I, so we had this because obviously recently John was on the show doing Black Christmas and we spoke about that. And I sort of feel the same way about something with this movie in regards to it's a, it's almost a, say, a shame that it's a seasonal movie because it deserves to be more than just a seasonal movie. Like for me, Black Christmas, if you, if you didn't set that at Christmas, it would still be a, fantastically made ridiculously dark fucked up movie take the christmas stuff out of it it's fucked up it's not nice it doesn't end well it's horrible but it's amazing and this film here with with silent night deadly night if you take the christmas stuff out of it obviously you'd have to work the story around it a little bit more but it actually is a prime example of almost a perfect slasher movie because it it ticks every sort of box you know yes you do get the performances you get the boobs uh you get the murders you get the cool kills you know you get the origin story yeah you get the origin story you know you get the characters that are dicks that you know that are gonna die you get the characters that are dicks that don't die that deserve to so it's actually a really really good example of what a slasher movie is supposed to be the problem is the same with Black Christmas is that it only tends to be watched around this time of the year. And then that sort of, you know, it's a disadvantage to the movie in regards to its iconography or its legacy, because then we, we aren't watching this film all year round or we're not talking about it all year round. Like something like I said, like Black Christmas is one of the best slashes to me personally ever made. But once I'm not going to watch it in summer, I watch it when it comes to Christmas and and that's I always feel there's a little bit of a shame when you get these Christmas movies that are actually really good and like you're saying like a really good character pieces and then they build on those characters they have a fantastic kills maybe not aesthetically or technically the most beautiful looking movies but it does have some nice looking shots in it but then we only sort of like think about it this time of year and then we watch it and we go actually that works it's a bit of a shame well and we talked like you mentioned we talked on that when when you and i talked about black christmas the only 
holiday theme movie that seems to have surpassed that problem for lack of better wording is Halloween. Yeah. Like that's the only movie that is set on a holiday or based around a holiday that I can think of that not just, you know, fucked up people like us, but in general, like people who like that movie will put that movie in any day of the year. Like there's no, it doesn't have to be Halloween to watch that movie, but just the fact that, and I agree with you that you could rewrite this so that it's not a Christmas movie and it would still work. I don't think it would be as fun because I think the Christmas angle kind of does yeah, yeah. for this movie more so than Black Christmas. I think for this movie, the Christmas angle really does add something to it. Maybe it's the absurdity or maybe it's just the believability of everything that happens in it. But well, thank God it's not Easter because he'd be in an Easter bunny outfit and it'd be fucking weird. I would have, well, there I've is a Easter it. Bunny Massacre movie, but don't it's bad or do because it's bad you know we we (laughs) we dabble in that this movie is you're right in that this is a movie that would work with or without the christmas stuff but i do think unlike black christmas where you probably could set it any time of the year and make the same movie and have it be just as effective yeah i think this movie is more effective because santa and christmas is such a predominant theme in this it not only adds to the character building but it really does add for me, to the overall enjoyment of the movie. And like I said on your episode, I don't fucking like Christmas. So when I can see people (laughs) fucking up Christmas for other people, I'm all for it. (laughs) So I don't really have anything to add past that. Do we want to get into hot dogs and then take our break? Yeah, I don't I don't see why not. I mean, I think that we could we could beat this into the ground about Billy and all the ideas, but I think it kind of stands alone. I think we've said a lot of a lot of things about the movie without totally point by pointing everything in it bp as our guest we're gonna put you on the spot unfortunately so sorry for that but uh why don't you go ahead and lead off on your kind of closing thoughts on this movie you've been here before if you want to do hot dogs you can if you don't if you feel like hot dogs are fucking dumb don't do hot dogs just let let us know your (laughs) kind of final thoughts on this just if you don't use hot dogs this will be muted this will be muted yeah (laughs) you'll just be like Hot dogs are a requirement. You know, that Santa that was deaf. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Father Henry over here. Yeah. 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 It's just, I mean, I I think I said it already, really, but I just think this works as a slasher. As you you said rightly, it does work as a Christmas movie. It's a shame that sometimes it is seen less because it's a Christmas movie. Uh, Yeah, I think overall it works. The standout to me is the the performance because when, like, as you look, you know as well like acting and filmmaking outside of this is what i wanted to do any way so when i'm watching movies i have like a checklist a checkbox so i always have to have these things and that's how i know if i enjoy a movie and so on and if you know if there's things that are missing from it then i don't enjoy the movie as much and stuff and one thing that i always take from this is how good his performance is how good his performance is but how annoying that it's sort of necessarily is overshadowed by the fact that it's a horror and the fact that it's a slasher, and the fact that it is what it is. But then I do enjoy the movie, but like I said earlier, even though the second one is literally this whole entire movie, and then the bits with Ricky shoved in at the end, I still prefer to watch the bits with Ricky shouting garbage day, holding a gun, nearly getting run over in probably the most exciting stunt put to screen because it was 100% a fucking accident and somebody nearly died on set that day. I will sit there and... The best stunts. Best stunts. Yeah, I will sit there and watch him do that. We tend to find those stunts on a stunts on a reoccurring basis on this show. So. Yeah, yeah, especially when you're watching ninja movies because everyone dies. What? Oh, no. Yeah. But yeah, you know, with Garbage, uh, garbage Day 2, I almost said, Garbage Day! But uh, <laughs> I had to do it, sorry. Um, Where's that movie? So it's interesting because this is more of a movie than that one is. But then do I get more enjoyment than watching? Like, I don't like, I don't think I like this movie enough for me to not take enjoyment over it. So that's where I am. So I will probably say that I will give this purely on the fact that it's got really good kills in it and the performance is really good. The rest of it doesn't really matter because it's mostly shit. Apart from the fact that a kid punches somebody in the face and it looks real uh and that guy went down like a sack of shit <laughs> uh I, I i i'll probably give this six what we saying six hot dogs six whatever i can't even fucking think of it i was trying to think so hard about something but i'm so dumb it doesn't fucking work uh i'm gonna give this six betraying son of a bitch sisters 
uh, out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I've got a fucking problem with her because it's all her fault. And uh, if she wasn't such a dick, then he wouldn't be in this problem. That might be the best rating scale I've ever heard. <laughs> Sharn, you want to go or you want me to go? I can go. All right. I think kind of piggybacking off what BP said, I think that this movie is, it's a really, it's a good movie just as a movie. Like the structure really works. You have the first half that really builds the origin story, the character of Billy, why he is the way he is. And then the second half of the movie is where you get all the violence, all the kills, all the things that you tune into this movie to see i think that again going off what bp said this movie going into this movie you have to know if you're going to get a a big and you know you're going to get the most enjoyment out of it you have to know that this is more of a slower paced movie until that second half if you want the movie where it's kind of a little bit more of the character building a little bit more of the you know lore or whatever backstory this is the movie to watch if you're looking for a christmas movie where it's just scene to scene killing people over the top things Part two is the one to see because this part two just condenses this movie into about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, and then moves on with Ricky's story and all the garbage day and all the crazy stuff that happens in that movie. But I think like a pure horror movie standpoint, part one's the one that you want to see if you're looking for over the top violence action, all that stuff. It's part two. Based on all saying all that for me, I think part one, as I said, in Violent Night, it kind of bucks the trend of all, you know, Christmas movies. When you think of Christmas movies, you think of it being sappy love stories about family, about sharing, about giving, about being a good citizen. Jesus is the reason for the season kind of stuff. But this this is a good a good time to watch this kind of movie because it's not that again worst case yeah. scenario this is should be called worst case scenario the movie i think that this for me this gets six and a half impalements out of 11 hot dogs you get you get the character building if you're like a, a a true not a true but if you're like a deep horror fan and you like to see all that character building you like to see why the characters are the way they are it's almost like the first movie is more of like a horror slash thriller slash slasher because you get the thriller kind of moments because you're getting the the build up to the character. If you want to see just the straight up horror slasher, just over the top shit, see part two. Just just to put that out there. So if someone hears this and not, has not seen this movie and they're like, oh, these guys really raved about this movie. I'm going to go see it. And then they're let down because it's not like the slasher, true <laughs> hardcore movie that they're expecting. If you're expecting that, I'd say go see part two and just kind of skip this because you'll get the same story. So I guess I'm going to buck the trend a little bit. This movie is, and similar to what I said way back when we talked about Sleepaway Camp and a couple other movies, this movie plays major nostalgia vibes for me. This is one of those video store relics that I found. It's kind of one of the movies that it's in that like tier of films that's like, this is the kind of movie that made me really fall in love with horror movies. It's sleazy. It's grimy. It's over the top. It's ridiculous. It's got all kinds of like re- insane gore kills. It's the kind of movie, as you mentioned earlier, Sean, that you watch it and you almost question yourself, like, am I supposed to be watching this? I'm not sure I should be. So I, I'm sure my personal experiences within that, like, you know, finding it at the right age, finding it like through, I, I feel like I have a stronger affinity for movies I find through a, vi- a video store than I ever will from something I found in streaming or whatever, just yeah, because yeah. it quick at the right time that all every single aspect of that is here for me so you tack that on with the fact that they do a really good job of character building and telling a very cohesive story which isn't always the case with this kind of movie that just adds to everything with it for me this movie is a solid eight Linnea Quigley's out of 10 cranberry holiday spice hot dogs. It's it really delivers pretty much everything I want in a horror movie, not just a slasher movie, but a horror movie from this era. And then I don't think it's any secret that slashers are kind of my bread and butter. They're the thing that I like to watch more than most like subgenres in horror. And when you add on the fact that it excels in all the elements of that, this is the kind of movie for me that, I mean, BP, I think we mentioned on your episode that you don't watch Black Christmas every year, but maybe every other year. Yeah. Maybe it was, maybe I'm hallucinating that. This one for me is an every year watch. Like I will put this on somewhere in December every year because I like it that much. And usually I won't. I did this week, but I won't watch one and two right back to back with each other because, as we mentioned, there's so much retelling of one that it it's kind of silly to do it. But I'll usually let it breathe for like a week and then I'll watch two and I get to see all the parts I like in one all over again and then see all the fucking insanity that is two that just kind of builds on what it's almost a, a perfect pair of movies. that If you were going to take a time capsule and say, tell me about 80s horror in two films, these would be two 
aside from the Christmas theme, be two really good films to pick up and say, this almost gives you the polar extremes of both things that you would get out of 1980s horror cinema. Yeah, well said. <laughs> so, with that, since I'm so well-spoken for the first time ever... <laughs> no, it's not. It's, I, was, I, was, I was really hey, very interested in yet. what you were saying. The funny thing is, is the, the first one that I watched the other night was Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. And that was the first one I showed my part of, partner for our uh, starting of, of the Christmas watches. She still hasn't seen the first one, so uh, we started the wrong way round, but I just wanted to see him shout garbage day. <laughs> yeah, we, we play that year round with us. So. Yeah. We've gotten hot dogs out of the way. We're all full and ready for a nice Christmas nap. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back with your responses to our question of the week and wrap up. If you're in the Detroit area, save the date for Thursday, December 21st at Batch Brewing Company for the next installment of Franks and Steins. Located at 1400 Porter Street, you can have a Frank. Fill your Stein with select beers for 11 bucks, and best of all, come watch Silent Night, Deadly Night with us for free. The movie starts promptly at 7 p.m. Don't be naughty, and we'll see you at Batch. Okay, so we're back after that long break, and uh, we are going to talk about our question of the week, which we reached out to you on, you being the loyal or not so loyal audience, but you did answer this week, so that's generally a good thing. So, questions of the week. You can always find these on our social media where we get feedback. This one was put up on Threads, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Twix. No one answered on Instagram, so fuck Instagram. Twix. Sorry, I forgot. That's the new... That's what we call it, Twitter and X together is Twix. Right. Until it goes bankrupt anyway. Leading off this week and our question of the week response, the question was pretty simple. Our question was, what is your favorite Christmas horror movie? Our first response was on Facebook, and it was from our friends over at Badge Brewing Company. So Badge Brewing Company said, quite honestly, this movie, referring to Silent Night, Deadly Night. Can we say this one? Since, you know, what they're referring to is we're going to be doing a screening of this movie at Badge Brewing Company in Corktown down in Detroit on the 21st of December in the year 2023. If you listen to it next this next year, we're not going to be doing this next year. So get there this you year. You could still show up. I'm sure they wouldn't mind the business. Yeah, that's true. We might have a different movie. Deck. We'll see. But come join us and hang out with us. Have a beer. Well, hang out with me. Have a beer and watch this incredibly sleazy movie and let's see if we ever do this again because there is a lot more gratuitous nudity and borderline rape in this than the last movie that we shot show that shown saw watched did show much too much rape at christmas that's what it's known for is the season so (laughs) (laughs) i think we just broke bp (laughs) i literally nearly spat my drink out every (laughs) Uh, we're going to find a way to clip that because I, I we broke a human being on this, so that's good. <laughs> so over on Threads, our friend Bearded Amoeba gave the answer that none has done it better than the original Black Christmas. BP, I know that you'll have uh, strong feelings about that one. Then we go over to Twitter where I'm bound to start fucking stuff up because people have weird usernames and all that shit. So over on Twix... Kevin and Jason, who is at KJ and a podcast, said they have their own podcast, which you can check out. I'm sure they have links to it up there. They said Gremlins, Gremlins 2, and Violent Night. So Violent Night, this is the first time that it came up. If you haven't listened to it yet, our episode on Violent Night's already up. You can hear us talk about that in more detail. Boomer, over at Podcast in the Woods, pulled out a movie that I have never fucking heard of, so good for him on that. I kind of want to find it now. It's a movie called The Day of the Beast which is a crazy, weird, and sometimes funny Christmas horror. Have either of you seen or heard of this movie? I feel like I've heard of it, but I definitely <laughs> haven't seen it. We're on a podcast and we're shaking our heads. <laughs> like, no, <Mm-mm>. yeah. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so, Boomer, congratulations. You've stumped the entire panel here today with A Day of the Beast, but this looks interesting enough that I'm, I'm going to try to find it. Good recommendation. I mean, Boomer generally does have good recommendations. He watches a, quite a bit of stuff. Brittany, who is over at Late and Confused on Twitter, said some of my freight favorite Christmas horror movies are the original Black Christmas, the buildup and the twist ending are so well done, Gremlins, cutest evil gifts ever, and Santa's Slay. Seeing Goldberg play the part of an evil Santa was just so much fun. Santa's Slay is a movie that one of these years we're going to talk about because watching him punt the cat into the ceiling fan is always a Christmas miracle. It's 
that scene alone is worth pulling that movie out for. At Last Sip, which is the Sip List podcast, said Violent Night is the tits. So another vote for that. <laughs> Loved it. Tangents of Horror, at Tangents of Horror, another podcast said Gremlins for sure is such a blend of family fun and horror. Do you guys like Gremlins? Like, I haven't watched that movie in so long, but I don't have a real affinity for it. It's been well, forever I mean, since I've seen it. I'm just about to probably talk about it, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Depends if you like it. Oh, good. <laughs> so true to form, Jordana is here to terrify and like piss off Sean. She says she Terrifier really loves three. Krampus. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah, oh, okay. That will be next year. I'm yeah, sure. already. She has mentioned she really loved Krampus. It's a great cast with great creatures and walks a fine line between fun and dark. She included this fucked up looking clown doll thing that's eating a human being in gift form. And the second that she sent it, I replied to her, I'm like, what in the fuck or what in the Sean would hate this fucking shit is this? So, yeah, it's pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know for sure which Krampus movie this is, but it looks fucked up. The boy with the Jason tattoo, who is at RD64109 on Quick, said P2, which I don't know which one that is. Black Christmas and the original uh, 2000, Black Christmas, the original and the 2006 remake of Black Christmas. Which one is P2? Do you, either of you know? Pulse 2. Maybe it's part is two of this. Chris? Maybe. Maybe. I, don't I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Neither do I. And I'm not even drunk yet. What, what the shit? Oh, so it's a, a movie about. It takes place. It's called P2. I thought it was like part two, but it's uh, something about I'm, this is just a Wikipedia like blur before you even go to it. It just says uh, a beautiful businesswoman who works on mid in Midtown Manhattan office block and gets stuck working late on Christmas Eve before leaving. Uh, yeah, that, that, that. yeah, I don't know which one you mean. Yeah, P2. I remember now. Our friends over at Dissect That Film gave a list of answers. They included the movie Gremlins, Krampus, Silent Night, Deadly Night. Black Christmas 74 and Black Christmas 06. So we're seeing the theme of some of these movies here, but these movies are classics for a reason. Stew World Order, which is at SWO Productions, said Black Friday 1974. Newman over at Movies for Days said Christmas Evil 1980, because nothing quite says Christmas like watching Santa fuck the mom. Tis the season. (laughs) To be jolly. Right. Grinning Skull Press which is at grinning underscore skull said it's a tie between rare exports and elves. Yes. It's a pink included poster. So elves elves. is like a really shit version of gremlins, but it's fun. It's one of those films. that's So, so shit. It's good. I gotta say rare exports is arguably the best movie we talked about last year that nobody fucking heard us talk about. That movie is a good film. Extremely underrated. It's a really good film. It's a really cool concept. And really does deserve more more shine on it so yeah if you haven't seen rare exports whether you want to go hear us talk about it or not i don't really care but go find that movie and watch it it's a really cool like take on a christmas story i care so go back and listen to it and go fucking listen to it i'll I'll share a link at some yeah go fucking listen to it why not and then let's see this is going to be a tongue twister let's see if i can get this right oh here we go fave five from fans podcast which is at fave five from fans Nice. She read that. That's good. Gremlins is always a good call. It made a it made the episode when Neil Frazier seventy eight and I covered them. Can't wait to hear yours. So and they include a link to their episode about Gremlins. Shameless plug. Yes. Good for you. That's what you should. Well, this is what I do. Shit. Hey, I'm I'm here for it. So sometimes I'm involved with it. So <laughs> BP, what is your favorite Christmas horror? You can ramble on as many as you want. You can focus on one. Educate us on what we should be doing for Christmas when it comes to horror movies. Mine, mine is purely just when I, I, it's nostalgia, and that's Gremlins. Just Gremlins is I've watched. Uh, I Gremlins is one of those films that I don't even know how many times I've watched. I had it from like VHS from when I was ridiculously young. Like I, it, I loved Gremlins so much that I still remember. You know when you have things when you were younger, and like like you have a visual image in your head and i had so many vhs tapes like so many horrors and i remember like it was a black official warner brothers case and it had like you know the classic gremlins poster on it and everything like that Uh, i have watched that movie so many times that i i don't even watch it at christmas i will just watch it whenever it's just gremlins is one of the most fun movies that for me personally it's ever been made and I just love that even when I watch it now, I don't even watch the movie. I'm looking in the background, especially in like the bar scene and stuff to see the different gremlins and stuff. And I, I will never bore 
from watching Gremlins. He's he was one of the. He's not. I don't even see it as a, like a Christmas movie. He's one of the greatest movies that's ever been made for me personally. I fucking love Gremlins, but the fact that it's set at Christmas means that it's a Christmas movie. So uh, that's that will be always probably be my favorite Christmas movie. But um, I, I was thinking about this before I came on because I don't think very often. So I thought I better think of something. <laughs> I do actually want to give a shout out to a film that came out last year that everybody seemed to hate and I absolutely loved. And I'm actually going to watch it probably tonight um, because it's now become like I'm, I know this is going to be a continuous thing where I watch it every Christmas. And it's a film called Christmas Bloody Christmas. I had fun with that movie. That movie yeah. is underrated. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, as I said earlier, like when when I'm watching movies, I hate it because my I can't just I can't just switch off. Like when I watch a movie there's a like when I'm watching it, I'm ticking all those boxes in my head, like cinematography, directing, sound, performances, and stuff like that, script, and all that sort of stuff. And the more boxes it ticks, the better it is. And Christmas, bloody Christmas, for some reason, I it just works so well. And I think a lot of it is because it was shot like very old school, you know, like wide angle lenses, you know, like very 70s style. And I love that aesthetic. Like to me, like that's still like when you watch something like Jaws or something like that, that to me is still one of the greatest looking movies ever made, that aesthetic. Or Steven Spielberg, for example, like his movies, they're, they're so cinematic and they look gorgeous. And for I don't know what it is, but they managed to sort of capture that on Christmas Bloody Christmas, but on a ridiculously low budget version of it. The script itself is a little bit too Rob Zombie. It doesn't work amazingly. They're very self-aware and it's a bit Rob Zombie, Quentin Tarantino in where they're very arrogant and up their own ass. But it's there's a still, lot of bad religion references, though. Yeah, and I love exactly. That that's one of the best bands out there. But if but if you took like that out of it and that like the arrogance to be like, I need to put my stamp on this script. The, the, the characters themselves are actually quite decent. They actually feel quite real. The aesthetic of the movie is absolutely gorgeous. I like I love how this movie looks. The sound works well. And it's just like a really fun like an old school slasher movie. Like it feels something that was made in the eighties and it doesn't really get much love. And I haven't really spoken to that many people far from John and that as well, like that have seen it. So if you haven't seen Christmas, bloody Christmas, go and watch it. If you think it's shit, that's your problem. Don't tell me about it. If you do, don't tell me about it. If you do, I think it was a shutter movie last year. Wasn't it? Yeah. Or one of those, it, it went to streaming before it didn't go to theaters. No, cause I, I honestly why... thought it was going to be shit, but it, turned out to be fantastic i enjoyed it but it has a little bit of that like borderline like i don't want to call it the the pigeonhole like it's so bad it's good it's not bad it's better than that it is a little like kind of connect the dots cookie cutter like before it's really just robot santa kills a bunch of people yeah yeah. which is basis of the movie but it's fun for what it is and it's you know it's got decent enough performances it's a low budget horror movie and if you like low budget horror movies there's no reason why you can't get into that for yeah an hour and a half or however long it is. I, th- I think that's one of my ch- the things that I love the charm of. I love I love it when you get people that get like not much and create something, you know, out of not much. You know, like my favorite film of all time is Donnie Darko, you know, very low budget, but managed to create a world that is every genre within it. And that's, I, I love these little films, films like Brick as well. Brick is one of the greatest films that's ever been made. But yet, they have no budget and it all becomes about putting these pieces, the puzzle pieces together and something like Christmas, bloody Christmas, like it's not on that level, but there's just something to it. And then it gets shit on. So what the fuck do I know? Sean, you want to go next? Or you want me to ramble off some Christmas cheer? No, I, I can go. I think for me, the movie that I think of, the horror movie I think of when I think of Christmas is this movie is silent, silent night, deadly night, mostly because of those imprints that were, you know, the impressions from, when I was a kid, seeing the cover in video stores and realizing that I was probably way too young to watch it at the time when I would see it. And it was the movie that I wanted to see when I got old enough to see it and remember it. Oh, yeah, that franchise, you know, you like I said earlier at the beginning, it's something that left such an impression of seeing it, the the, the poster, or the cover of it with the arm and the axe, the Santa going down the chimney was just it was a movie when I remembered that I could see it. <laughs> it was a movie that I wanted to see and and it just left such an imprint that it makes me think I mean you got killer santa claus you got a this whole thing where killer killer where santa's slashing up a bunch of people he's not the real santa but 
he's definitely a Santa. So for me, I think this movie is, is that. And I love the fact that it's another example. Of, he is the real Santa. Yeah, I love the fact that it's another example where nostalgia wins. Because, because it's like you didn't even like necessarily rate this at like, a, you know, an eight or a nine. Like this was what, 6.5 was it you gave it? Mm-hmm. And yet you so you know that this isn't necessarily, you know, a top tier. Yeah, it's not the best. But, it, but it's just the fact that like there, there, there's a love that we have, you know, and, and there's nostalgia in our. And when when that happens, that's like better than anything. It's like better than the quality of whatever the whatever it is. It's the fact that like when we think about it, you know, like Gremlins could be the worst fucking film in the world. It's not. It's great, but it could be. But my nostalgia for it <laughs> and my love for 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 when I was a kid. You know, and you're like, oh, I can't wait to see this and stuff. And that I love it when that wins. Yeah, it's always the impression. You know, it's like when you yeah. see certain films might not be like you like you just said, certain films might not be the best, but they left such an impression on you that to you, like even I, I I'm not going to rank this movie a 10 out of 10 or I'm sorry, an 11 out of 11, but <laughs> it's just a fun movie. Like you can just yeah. sit down and watch it. I'm I'm not so much of a, of a fan of watch a movie, turn your brain off. But, you know, this is one of those movies and it works. You don't have to scrutinize everything that goes on. You you could just passingly watch this and realize how poorly this this poor kid was was treated leading yeah. up to Christmas. But it's still you know, it's a fun flick. So speaking of watch this and turn your brain off, which I am a fan of, these are my favorite. But I want to mention Santa Jaws is a great, <laughs> wonderful piece of Christmas shit that is absolutely worth watching. I know BP has a real admiration for these movies, but Jack Frost one and two are incredible <laughs> pieces of shit and wonderful Christmas movies that are worth putting on. But there's no doubt that admiration is a strong word. Yeah. yeah well, that's why I went with it. <laughs> I'm kind of amazed that of the three of us, no one has brought up by Christmas. So I will bring up that the 1974 movie is definitely the better film from a how it's made just all that shit like it's it's a great film and really deserves you know it's to be mentioned more in this conversation yes. yeah but silent night deadly night one and two are unquestioned like number one reigning champ christmas christmas movie period like not just horror movie like there's most of the time when i want christmas movies i kind of want something a little more i don't necessarily want like your traditional like i don't want love actually i don't want you know that type of shit no but you no, generally not. But I do like more. No, like they're the ones that make me want to go out and commit murder, like the movie. Exactly. But as far as like Christmas horror movies, Silent Night, Deadly Night one and two, they they stand alone at the top of the apex for me. So I don't think that's a surprise. Those are the ones that for me they just work. It's it hits the nostalgia. It hits the VHS like video store vibes. It, you know, it's why I got into Christmas horror movies in the first place. And realistically, if you're going to give me a Christmas slasher movie, it's probably the one that I'm comparing it to, whether it's fair. Yeah, nostalgia is a powerful thing. I fucking love it. That's why we keep getting fucking Star Wars and Halloween movies and got to build new nostalgia. Listening to dipshits online like who is Sarah Carpenter or Kara Carpenter's dad in Scream? I don't fucking care. I don't give a fucking shit. Let me live my life. I think my response was stop trying to Star Wars Scream movies, fucker. So, so. On that, uh, what else do we want? Do we have anything else we want to add before we kind of start wrapping here? So Sean is frowning. BP, the floor is yours. Please plug everything that you possibly can that you want to do, what you got going on. Let people know where they can find you. Um, you know, <laughs> the worst bit, because I have to try and plug myself and then my anxiety goes and I feel like I just want to shit myself. You know, look, so every month you've got the podcast um if you listen to it already thank you if you don't it's your own fucking fault don't mug yourself over if you love horror go and listen to the podcast every month you've got a podcast episode that comes out on every podcast platform the thing that i'm really excited about which obviously i'm plugging like mad at the moment is exclusive to our youtube channel which if you haven't subscribed make sure you do it's free so there's no point in not doing it but it's so and the same we do pod monster it's all free we don't we're not charging for it so just fucking do it but yeah so the new series comes out we're not charging yet. yeah 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 but the new series yet but yeah so the new series which is called welcome to the creep zone it's still all let's talk horror but welcome to the creep zone the first episode comes out i'm hoping december mid-december so you'll have a podcast episode at the start of every month you have the new series uh, on youtube mid-december the first guest we had we've already mentioned about jordana our mutual friend jordana from pretty kid a podcast we spoke about creep one and creep two so if you haven't seen those movies then i mean they're fucking fantastic handheld horrors so go and watch them. But yeah, I, I'm really excited about the new series because it's it's unedited, it's unfiltered, it's unscripted. 
so it's making me feel like shit every time I do one. I feel like I'm going to pass out every single second, but it's fun. So go and go and get ready for that. And then, yeah, listen to the podcast. Basically two different things every single month. I've said too much already. Don't know what I'm doing. There we go. <laughs> and we'll, we'll link those in the so, show notes. Thanks. Absolutely. <laughs> so if you want to follow us and watch me retreat everything and share everything that BP does, because like I said, at the beginning of this episode, he's one of our favorites. But if you want to find us, we're on every social media platform that's available at Dewey Pod Monster. If you search us, you're going to find us. Our website is crap.town. You can go back and listen to our rare export episode or any other episode that we've done. And you can find us on YouTube also at Dewey Pod Monster. And that leaves us with Sean. Sean, what do you have that you want to talk about? What, where can we find you when you're actively avoiding talking about horror movies? I was just <laughs> going to add, if you want, as many people answered the question a week, if you want yours read on the podcast, to follow us at Dewey Pod Monster on all the social platforms, as John said. Also, if you're interested in Michigan beer or you're just interested in hearing my very um, infrequently shared opinions on things, and I mean, when I say infrequent, I mean like once a year, you can check me out on social media. You can check me out on YouTube at youtube.drafttherapy.com, social media at Draft Therapy. Every now and then he chimes in and calls me an idiot, so that's always good. Bonus reason to <laughs> follow Dewey Pod Monster. Bonus content. But I, <laughs> verbal abuse. Yeah, it's what we excel at. We yeah. punish. So I think that's all we got. This is our last episode before the holiday. We might have one more Christmas episode for you, hint, hint. But if you're hearing this before December 21st and you're in the Detroit area, come have a beer with us over at Bad Brewing Company. We would have fun with that. And then we will talk to you next week on Ish. I'm just going to kick my cat out uh, because otherwise he's going to meow um, and he's a dick. So give me two seconds. <laughs> You're going to include that, right? It's... Yelling off camera is the best. Yelling off mic is the best. Usually thing. it's me yelling at the dog. Or me <laughs> going upstairs in the creaky door and, yeah. hey, <laughs> what are you doing up there? So. Also, as well, I, did, I, forgot, I should have added in into the episode, but it don't matter anyway. But why is it always fucking cats and uh, cats in Christmas movies, like Christmas horrors, like Black Christmas, Christmas cat, uh, Christmas cat in Silent <laughs> Night? Like they always there's always fucking True. cats in them. I think it's just cats across the board. I don't I don't know if it's I think it's just yeah. movies. Like cats are creepier than dogs are. Dogs yeah, are the true. ones that like attack people and yeah. uh, you know maul them to death and whatnot and cats are the ones that just divert your attention and jump scare you they need to do a you know, film just... where like there's a cat in the background the whole time and there's loads of murders happening and you think it's this one person but it's actually been the, but cat, it's the cat the whole time yeah <laughs>